Hi everybody, uh, my name is Sarah Myers and I'm going to be talking to you guys about sepsis today. So in terms of our learning outcomes for this lecture, the things that we're going to talk about, so we'll have a little bit of a look at um, epidemiology of sepsis. We'll talk about the sepsis criteria and some terms that you've probably heard um, and the current sort of recommended, um, I guess, language that's used around sepsis. We'll talk about recognising sepsis, um, some of the signs and symptoms that you might see, and then we'll go through some different cases. So in terms of sepsis epidemiology, um, sepsis has a really high burden of disease. So there's around 49 million cases and 11 million deaths worldwide. This was back in 2017 when a really big study was done on sepsis. One in five deaths worldwide are related to sepsis. Now, obviously, a huge percentage of this is in those sort of low and middle income countries. Um, there's a really big burden in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in the Pacific Islands, which are essentially our neighbours. So it is something quite close to home. Um, greater than 40% of all cases worldwide are in children less than five. Obviously, again, this is much higher percentage in those um, sort of lower and middle income countries. Now, in terms of, um, we obviously know there's a big burden of morbidity and mortality worldwide. There's around um, 55,000 cases of sepsis per year um, in Australia. And when we look at the incidence of sepsis requiring ICU admission, it's reported as sort of 0.7 per 1,000 people or greater than 15,000 cases a year. Now, those costs, so a cost of a, an admission, and these are the ICU admissions, estimated cost is around $40,000 per admission, and that's only the ICU admissions, so that doesn't take into account all of the admissions um, to hospital that don't actually make it into ICU, and it accounts for around, you know, 8,700 deaths per year, which is a larger number than breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. Now, when we look at those people who are at higher risks, obviously we talk about the very young, so less than one years old, but also you know under the five year old mark, but particularly the younger um, children, greater than 85 years old, your immunocompromised patients, so your patients having chemotherapy or any other sort of treatment like that. And there's a higher risk, um, the incidence is higher in males than it is in females. So recognition is key. Some of the data has shown us that essentially each hour that there's a delay in administering antibiotics, you increase the risk of death by close to 8%. So really recognition, um, early treatment is, is the main um, important key. All right, so just talking about some of the definitions. So these are probably things that you have heard and there's a bit of a sort of mix up of some of the terms that are thrown around, but this will hopefully clear it up a little bit and explain it a bit better for you. So there is the, um, the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American College of Chess Physicians uh, in 1992 initially came up with these definitions. Um, and this, this was then all um, the definitions that were talked about in the surviving sepsis campaigns. So they um, divided it up into SERS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and then septic shock. So as you can see here, and again, like I say, these are probably things you've heard about. So SERS, which talked about high or low temperatures, tachycardia, like an uh, increased respiratory rate and uh, raised or low white cell count. Um, and then you needed two of, of any of those things. Then sepsis was SERS with a proven or suspected infection. Severe sepsis, obviously you've then got um, your acute organ dysfunction and that's defined by any of the things below. So blood pressure, um, raised lactate, raised iron uh, and then obviously you know as we get into these further down things you obviously need blood tests to be able to determine these things um, so obviously you raise bilirubin you decreased urine output raised creatinine reduction in platelets and a, and a low spo2 and then septic shock so septic shock was defined as sepsis with 
hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So they were the old terms um, that used to be used and obviously these things often still are used, some of these terms. So then um, the international consensus for sepsis um, was uh, held again, so the third one, and that's why this is now called sepsis three. So these are the new definitions and this was a couple of years back. Um, so what they've now, um, or what they're now defining um, for sepsis is a, a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulation um, host response to infection. We'll talk a bit more about um, how sepsis is essentially um, the the order the dysregulation of the host response and and the way that the body responds to the infection. Then we talk about organ dysfunction and that's where the SOFA score comes in and we're going to talk about the SOFA score. Um, but basically they use the SOFA score to determine organ dysfunction. Then we have septic shock, um, which is essentially um, your shock associated with sepsis. So your profound hypotension um, that requires vasoactives despite um, after fluid resuscitation. Um, and then we'll talk about our QSOFA score as well. So um, we'll have a little bit of a look at that so far. So the SOFA score, so SOFA stands for Sepsis Related Organ Failure Assessment. Now this is the full SOFA score and as you can see here it's one, it's quite complicated and two, it involves obviously things that need, you know, you need blood tests and other things associated with this. Um, but essentially each system you get a score and the higher the score the increase um, risk of death essentially. So what we tend to look at more is the QSOFA score, which is a screening tool, um, but essentially it looks at just three things. So your systolic blood pressure, less than 100, altered mentation, and a respiratory rate greater than 22. And it basically is any two of these things um, you should be thinking about sepsis. So obviously, like I said, it's a screening tool. So people can have sepsis without having the QSOFA greater than two. And patients can also have a QSOFA greater than two and not have sepsis. So that's your other types of shock mainly. So your cardiogenic shock, PE, etc. But essentially, if you use this, this the QSOFA score, score is quite um, handy to be able to be used. And it's, it's something that's then easy for example, as a paramedic, um, you don't have access to blood tests and other results, but if, someone meets this criteria on this screening tool then it raises your suspicion and it's something to kind of trigger you to be aware that maybe there is something uh there is sepsis um with this patient so when we look at um the sites of infection so the epic 2 study um, which looked at sepsis in australia um and this just looked this is just the um the sites of infection um, where so where the infection particularly was and as you can see here the um, highest percentage is uh, lung related um, sepsis so respiratory sepsis um, and then there's 20% abdominals 15% were bloodstream infections and 14% were sort of renal and genitourinary tract so that gives you a bit of an idea of um, where these infections are most commonly commonly coming from there's obviously also lots of other um, options but they were much uh, smaller um, percentages in the whole, um, the total of people who had sepsis. So in terms of the pathophysiology of sepsis, it's really complicated. So um, as we've talked about, sepsis is um, the host response. It's, it's all associated with the host, so the body's response to the infection. So you obviously have an infection, some sort of pathogen, you know, you might have um, a bacterial pneumonia and the pathogens activate the immune cells then so you get this stimulation of the host immune response um, to that pathogen and it triggers the release of cytokines so you've got your um, TNF alpha your interleukins interferon um, and this leads to a systemic inflammatory response 
and you get things like fever, you get leaky capillaries, um, your activation of your neutrophils and coagulation system. Um, and that can be quite complicated with all of the different things that are released. Um, it, it, there used to be talk about how there was like a sort of pro-inflammatory state um, period and then an anti-inflammatory period. Um, what they've shown now is that generally those two um, sort of, uh, I guess, those two uh, inflammatory states, so the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory state are essentially concomitant and so they happen at the same time and it's almost a battle between the two. Um, so the body has this pro-inflammatory state going on and then also the anti-inflammatory state of trying to calm that down. And what's happened is now that more people are surviving that initial period of sepsis with their shock, you know, with ICU admissions, we're then seeing an increase in these post-sepsis. They then, patients then become very susceptible to secondary infections. Um, and it's thought that there's almost an immune paralysis where the immune system then just can't function at all. Um, and so hence they're at much greater risk of secondary infections um, in ICU. So in terms of clinical presentation, just a couple of the things that we look at and obviously we think about our different body systems. So in terms of your cardiac system, your look at your tachycardia, hypotension, poor perfusion, so your capillary refill. Um, patients often get acute biventricular heart failure, um, and that can just be a temporizing, uh, sort of temporary state with the sepsis, um, and high lactate as well. Um, the Particularly with your tachycardia and hypotension, important things to remember is in, um, for example, your pediatrics, you'll often your biggest concern is your tachycardia um, and pediatric patients will tolerate and they will compensate for a very long time. And so if you have hypotension in a pediatric patient, that's um, extremely bad and often sort of uh, you're heading towards like pre-terminal or pre-arrest kind of state um, with that. In terms of your respiratory, um, so you get a variable degree of respiratory failure. Obviously, if you're if it's a respiratory sepsis, then that might be one of the presenting sort of issues that um, they're having difficulty breathing, increased respiratory rate, decreased saturations. So they've got inability or reduced ability to transfer oxygen um, with the actual lung issue that's going on. Um, ARDS is quite common in sepsis patients sometimes if they're respiratory sepsis but also other sepsis patients can then develop ARDS as a sort of secondary complication of their infection and um, that sort of pro-inflammatory state in the body. In terms of your renal function, so um, it's very common to get an acute kidney injury. This can be um, sort of twofold so it can be primarily from hypotension and poor perfusion to the kidneys um, associated with the sepsis, or it can be, um, there can also be kidney damage from that sort of pro-inflammatory state as well. So you'll often get reduced urine output. Um, obviously some people can end up on dialysis um, as well if, if that kidney injury is quite severe. Um, in terms of your liver, so again, the hypotension can cause liver damage, so you can get hepatocellular injury. Um, the liver contributes to immune cell production and the cytokine production as well. So um, that can also have an effect and it, it can also be involved in coagulation derangements. Um, as we have discussed, the coagulation system is already triggered by the pro-inflammatory state. So that can also contribute to that. Uh, in terms of sort of neurological um, things, so you can get a sepsis associated encephalopathy and so that's when you start getting your altered GCS and again there can be lots of um, things associated with this so it can be or it's thought to be um, in association with the sort of pro-inflammatory cytokine state but also poor perfusion so your hypotension that um, you're seeing from your sepsis can also contribute to that. 
Um, and this is particularly looking at sepsis that's not related to, like it's not a, um, you know, a neurosepsis, so it's not a, a meningitis or anything like that. Obviously, if it is meningitis and that's the actual cause of sepsis, then you'll definitely be expecting to see some neurological changes. So in terms of our treatment principles for sepsis, um, recognition, as we've said, is the key. So early recognition, um, and that's, you know, it's important uh, for you guys playing that role. If you recognize or, or have suspicion, making sure that's raised when you um, bring a patient into the hospital so that the patient is seen in a timely fashion. Um, obviously, there's a lot of investigations that get done. It's um, always advised to sort of take your bloods, do your blood cultures, and then give broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, obviously, some patients, it's less clear of the source. So it's blood cultures, urine culture, chest x-ray, um, any other imaging that might be appropriate. Um, maybe they need a lumbar puncture if, it's, if there's any sort of neurological concerns. Um, then IV fluid resuscitation, and this is something that often is commenced pre-hospitally. Um, and then we, following fluid resuscitation, we look at vasoactive drugs. So in hospital, we generally um, would use noradrenaline as our first line agent. Um, Pre-hospitally, um, adrenaline is the agent that can be used. Um, and the CCPs can run those infusions if need be. Obviously, as I said, imaging as indicated, and then source control. Source control is really important for sepsis if it's um, something that needs to be source controlled. So for example, your intra-abdominal sepsis, if it's um, say a bowel perforation, um, that patient needs to have an operation because we're not going to be able to fix that with antibiotics. So we're gonna look at a couple of cases um, and these cases are all people that I have seen or have been involved in their care um, in either ED or ICU. So the first case is a 22 year old male who presented to ED, self presented and was feeling generally unwell. He had initial baseline observations done in triage and they were normal and he was triaged as a CAT4. Um, and was put into the waiting room. Um, it was really busy, obviously, as you all know, EDs are always really busy. Um, so he was in the waiting room. So about an hour later, he self-presented to the desk and said he felt dizzy. So they did another set of ops, and these are his ops. So he's tachycardic, he's hypotensive, he's febrile, his respiratory rate's up, and his saturation's a 92 on room air, which for a healthy 21-year-old should probably make you wonder what's going on. So differential diagnoses. Now, this is something that um, obviously we could, uh, if, if we weren't doing all this um, lectures online now, we could talk about this um, as a group but um, maybe you can have a think about it and think what what sort of issues you might be wondering about. Obviously, it's a lecture on sepsis, so we're going to say that sepsis is one of our differential diagnoses. Um, but there's you know, a lot of other non-infectious things that you should also consider. Um, you know, does he have a PE? Is there something else going on? So in terms of management, so the patient obviously was noted to be unwell. Um, so he was transferred to acute in the emergency department. He had um, cannulas, two cannulas put in. He had bloods and blood cultures taken. He was given broad spectrum antibiotics and had some aggressive fluid resuscitation. And this was all done really rapidly. It was recognized that he was unwell. And this was all done in a sort of less than an hour. Um, so good time to antibiotics once it was recognized um, and that. So that was all done really well. Essentially what happened was an hour later, despite good treatment, he obviously, as you can see here from his observations, he's still getting worse. So his heart rate's 140, his blood pressure's 70 on 40, his respiratory rate's 24. His um, sats are now 92% with eight liters of oxygen via a Hudson mask. He's still febrile um, and his GCS has dropped. Um, so he's now GCS 11. 
So this patient has continued to deteriorate despite best sort of an appropriate um, management. So at this point, he was transferred to recess. He was pre-oxygenated and the decision was to intubate the patient. Um, so for ongoing investigation and management, it was recognised this patient was really unwell. Um, and the best thing was to semi-electively um, intubate him now. Um, so that was done. So induction um, was no concerns. He was intubated, grade one airway, no issues there. He was started on vasopressors. Um, and had sort of invasive lines inserted, so arterial line and central line, and um, had ongoing management with those. So in terms of that, so obviously after all of that, he's then admitted to ICU. So in terms of his early ICU admission, so the next 24 hours, he had a really high vasoactive requirement, um, was on noradrenaline and adrenaline and vasopressin, so three different vasoactives. Um, he had progressive renal failure um, with associated severe acidosis and was commenced on dialysis. So you can see at this point, this patient's extremely unwell. Um, and we started with a 20-year-old 20, 20 who presented to the ED generally unwell. So in terms of his diagnosis, um, this patient ended up having invasive group A strep. Um, obviously this wasn't known for the first sort of 24 hours until blood cultures came back positive, um, but got broad spectrum antibiotics anyway. So it was still adequately covered in terms of his antibiotic therapy. Okay, so in terms of the outcomes for this patient, um, he had quite a prolonged and rocky admission to ICU or hospital overall. So he, in his first week in ICU, he had ended up having multiple amputations. So he ended up with ischemic limbs. So he had uh, bilateral below knee amputations and he also lost multiple fingers. So had multiple trips to theater. He ended up having, uh, getting transferred to a tertiary center for a complex bowel operation, post perforated bowel, um, and then was transferred back to the uh, sort of regional hospital that he had been in. He um, actually did survive. Um, he survived to discharge um, and had, as I said, had an extensive hospital admission, required a lot of rehabilitation and then needed um, obviously fitting of um, prosthesis for his lower limbs, um, but did actually, I think he was in hospital for about four months total. So obviously, as I said, um, invasive group A strep. Um, so group A strep, it's a bacterium that's often found in the throat and on the skin. It causes sore throats for your strep throat. You can get skin infections, impetigo and cellulitis. Also does cause um, acute rheumatic fever and you can get post-strep glomerulonephritis from this. Um, in terms of invasive group A strep, it's far less common, um, but it is severe and as we can see sometimes life-threatening um, the patients who get invasive group a strep often have a very rapidly progressive um, disease and rapidly progressive shock which is what we've seen in this case um, the higher risk are obviously your young old and immunocompromised patients so in terms of pitfalls i think this is a really um, important case for looking at your pitfalls so um, you know, as a paramedic, you'll often go to the um, patient who's generally unwell, um, just kind of having these things in the back of your mind. Obviously, most patients who are generally unwell are not going to end up like this patient did, um, but trying to think um, and remember and wonder maybe why someone's called. Do they just have a bad feeling? Do they just feel unwell and they can't explain why? Sometimes these things, although they seem frustrating and when you've worked for 11 hours already and not eaten, it can be frustrating um, and you might feel like it's a waste of your time. But as you can see from this case, the patient presented with very minimal symptoms and quite normal observations and within two hours was um, intubated in ICU. So that really rapid deterioration is something that can happen. So always rechecking your vital signs and just making sure that things haven't changed. Um, is quite important. Okay, so our second case. Um, so the second case is a 55 year old female 
Um, so the husband called QAS because the patient was unable to be roused. When QAS arrived, the patient was GCS 13, rousable but confused, quite hypotensive, so blood pressure of 60 on 40 with a heart rate of 110, respiratory rate of 22, as you can see sat there at 85 on room air and um, afebrile. She had quite severe abdominal distension and pain um, and the ECG met STEMI criteria. So differential diagnosis for this case. Again, like we said before, we're talking about sepsis today. So obviously sepsis needs to be on your list of differentials. But um, as you can see from the case that I've just shown you, the patient also did meet STEMI criteria. Um, and so is this actually a STEMI um, versus sepsis versus other causes? Obviously with abdominal distension and pain, you'd worry about um, aortic rupture or something like that um, there's lots of things that would make you worried um, and that you would have on your mind with this patient so in terms of QAS management this patient was really difficult um, IV access and was actually just rushed to hospital they didn't get any access at all um, so just always consider IO access and consider CCP backup obviously if if you're really close to hospital, sometimes it is appropriate to just basically put the patient in the ambulance and drive to hospital. Make sure you notify the hospital um, that you're coming so they can be prepared. So in the emergency department, um, they managed to get IV access, but they also had difficulty as well. So they got some IO access um, and got an early central line because she was just such difficult, so difficult to get access on. Now, she was started on an adrenaline infusion um, and that was really a lot of concern. Obviously, the patient met STEMI criteria, but in the context of her distended abdomen, um, there was a lot of concern from ED staff about thrombolysis. Um, you know, is this patient actually going to need an operation? Does she actually maybe have a PE? Is there like, you know, any number of other possibilities of what's going on? Um, is there some sort of vessel rupture? And obviously giving thrombolysis in that situation could be disastrous. So they elected to um, do an urgency to your abdomen prior to um, giving thrombolysis. So they did the CT abdomen and she had a bowel obstruction with a perforated viscous, um, free gas and free fluid throughout the abdominal cavity. What was interesting was once the patient's blood pressure stabilised with the adrenaline, um, the ECG changes actually resolved. Um, and as a side note, um, sort of longer term, her troponins and things like that were all essentially negative. So had not had a major cardiac event um, and it was all hypotension related. So the, the cardiac muscle was just under so much strain from the hypotension and the lack of oxygen supply that, um, that they, it was starting to, to um, have ECG changes. So source control. So as we mentioned before, one of the important things, um, if possible, patients need source control. So the patient went to theatre, so was um, obviously still quite unstable, was intubated in theatre by anaesthetics, um, was a reasonably you know, difficult anaesthetic because she was quite unstable. Um, she had a laparotomy um, with a small bowel resection had fecal and fluid all through the abdomen, so had a significant abdominal washout, um, and then ongoing shock. So these patients often have um, shock, particularly post-op, when you sort of go in and um, start sort of moving things around and touching everything and cleaning it up, but they often get a sort of septic shower post-op. So quite profoundly shocked um, and transferred to ICU intubated and ventilated for ongoing um, sepsis management. So in terms of the ICU admission to this patient, um, she had profound shock for the first 48 hours of admission. Shock um, can be quite challenging with, particularly with the intra-abdominal um, patients. The surgeons are often, um, you know, uh, get quite uncomfortable depending on the operation they've done. If they've done an anastomosis, um, so put like two ends of bowel just straight back together. They're often quite um, reluctant for us 
to be using really high doses of sort of vasoactive medication because of um, the risk to the anastomosis, but also at the same time, severe hypotension will risk the anastomosis as well. Um, so she ended up actually having to go back to theatre on day two um, and have further bowel resection due to ischemic bowel. Um, and then did settle down after that relook um, and so was intubated for about seven days in ICU. Um, the shock resolved, um, obviously was treated with antibiotics as well. So intra-abdominal sepsis, so as we said earlier, when we looked at um, the different sort of sources, um, it's about 20% of causes of um, sepsis presentations. You generally need source control. So obviously it depends on what it actually is. There are, you know, there are some things that um, they can't actually source control, but obviously doing the appropriate imaging and if it is something like a perforated viscous or ischemic gut or any of those types of things, there really isn't much other option and they do need to definitely take them to theatre. Um, and sometimes, you know, return to theatre. So we'll often have patients um, that are really sick like this. They actually will do the laparotomy. Um, it's a source control laparotomy and then they actually will often leave the sort of two... Um, end loops of the bowel they'll often just staple them um, and leave the patient with an open abdomen for the first 24 hours in icu and take them back to theater so they just cover the abdomen up obviously but they'll leave it open we'll keep them in icu um, and then they take them back to theater to have another look and make sure everything's okay before they actually close them up um, because otherwise they'll often need to take them back at some point anyway okay so Case three. So this case is a 40-year-old um, female who had a background of a recent diagnosis of biventricular heart failure of unknown origin. Um, and she presented to ED with lower abdominal pain and hypotension. So differential diagnoses. Again, as we've said, consider sepsis because that's what we're talking about. Um, but obviously the the differentials for this patient are quite broad. She had sort of generalized lower abdominal pain. Um, so, I mean, that could be anything you'd think about um, as something to do with the bowel, think about the reproductive organs, urinary tract, um, her hypotension in the context of biventricular failure. Um, hypotension is essentially quite common and it's something that you'll see a lot. So this was definitely a confounding factor in this case and you'll see it a, a little bit more as we go on that it probably did delay her um, appropriate treatment was a bit delayed because of this background history of biventricular failure. So in terms of her management in the emergency department she had bloods done, she did actually have a little bit of a, a acute kidney injury um, she had a urine dipstick that showed greater than 500 light cells, so was presumed to have a UTI. So she got admitted to hospital to the medical ward. She was charted oral antibiotics but hadn't been given any um, and had ongoing hypertension but was not considered to be a concern due to her recent heart failure diagnosis. And they actually did, so in hospital with the vital signs, they um, we can do modifications and mods on the vital sign chart and that was done for her so basically to tell the nurses we're not concerned unless her, i think it was blood pressure below 85 i think is what they had done for this patient so patient then deteriorated so about 4 a.m in the morning she had a met call for hypotension um, and as you can see here, she it was a lot more than hypotension at the time. So she had a blood pressure of 75 or 40. She was profoundly tachycardic at 130. Um, and in a patient with biventricular failure, you don't want them to be tachycardic like that. Um, she had a respirate of 24, sats of 92 on a couple of litres of oxygen and was febrile. She was GCS 11, um, so she was sort of becoming more drowsy as well. And she had a lactate of 5. Now, when you looked back through her blood, she had previously had a lactate of sort of 2.5 or 3, and that was assumed to be in association with her heart failure, but obviously it hadn't been reassessed, it hadn't been determined if it was getting better or worse until this point. 
So um, the patient was admitted to ICU. So she was obviously quite tricky in terms of suspected sepsis, hypotension, but really poor heart function. And so giving her a lot of fluids is a really bad idea to this patient. She obviously, we still do give them some fluids, but you need to be a lot more careful in the fluid resuscitation with this kind of patient. So she was admitted to ICU. Um, it was decided to electively intubate and ventilate so that we could um, get the patient to the CT scanner and do all the things that needed to be done for her in the like the safest and most, most appropriate way. So she had invasive lines inserted. She was quite tricky to manage her hypotension um, and trying to settle the heart rate as well and optimise the heart's function because her heart failure was quite bad. Um, so she was transferred to CT um, and had a CT abdo and she had quite a significant renal abscess that was found. So in terms of her outcome, so she uh, was quite a complicated patient um, and it was determined that she shouldn't have an operation in the hospital that she was currently in. So there was lots of discussions and she ended up being transferred to a tertiary hospital um, and basically went straight to theatre and had a nephrectomy. Um, so they had to remove the right kidney um, and it was sort of um, basically falling apart when they took it out um, because of this abscess. Um, she ended up intubated for about six days in ICU um, and had lots of sort of ongoing ICU um, post-intubation ICU complications as well. Okay, so um, obviously this patient had urosepsis and she was quite a complicated urosepsis, um, but as we've looked at before, urosepsis counts for about 14% of sepsis presentations, so it's a significant number. So it's important to think about in patients who have UTI symptoms and hypotension. Um, and even in the sort of straight board, it's, you know, it's a UTI, no renal abscess or anything complicated like this. But um, some of the common um, bugs, so things like E. coli that cause UTIs, um, produce an endotoxin, which can contribute to the hypotension. So in terms of pitfalls from this case, obviously your comorbidities that lead to, I guess, ignoring or um, assuming that the abnormal vital signs are normal for that patient. So her low blood pressure in the context of her very severe biventricular heart failure um, did probably delay her getting um, appropriate care um, in the context that everyone sort of determined that it was okay because of her heart failure. So they're just things to think about, um, you know, second, it's always good to sort of, I guess, question yourself when you're determining that something is okay or normal for that person, just question if, if that's definitely true. So in terms of the ambulance guidelines, um, so again, the things that we've talked about for sepsis are early recognition. So you can use your QSOFA as a screening tool, um, but essentially recognizing and passing that information on. So always ask for backup if required, um, IV or IO access if you can't get IV access, um, IV or IO fluids, consider antibiotics. So we haven't really talked about um, meningococcal, but obviously in any suspicion of meningococcal, um, then antibiotics is appropriate pre-hospitally. So QAS, it's ceftriaxone, but some of the other ambulance services in Australia, it's benzyl penicillin. Um, whatever the antibiotic is that you carry, if there's concerns for meningococcal, um, then definitely give those. Um, and then adrenaline infusions, which is something that can be done by the CCPs if the patient is profoundly shocked. Um, so that's something to consider getting uh, their assistance. Obviously. All right, so in terms of sepsis and our takeaway points, as we've said over and over, early recognition, um, and this is something that's really important. Uh, and when you're working pre-hospitally, you do play an important role in this part um, of sepsis. So you guys are the first ones to see the patients. It's important for you to recognize and then pass that on, you know, notification to um, ED. When you get to ED, telling them that you think the patient has sepsis um, at that, you know, 
pointing that out and raising that makes people aware, makes people think about it, and it's really important for it to be recognised early on. Early antibiotics, again, like we said, pre hospitally if um, if you're suspicious of meningococcal, is definitely appropriate. Um, otherwise, in ED, patients get quite early, um, aggressive, broad-spectrum antibiotics. There's lots of guidelines um, in hospital about the antibiotics to give in essentially sepsis of unknown origin. Um, and we start with very broad spectrum antibiotics and then we uh, narrow them down over the coming days when we find out um, the exact bug or the exact cause of the sepsis. Fluid resuscitation. So fluid resuscitation has changed quite a bit over time. We haven't specifically talked a lot about it. Um, you know, it's definitely something that can be initiated pre-hospitally. Um, you know, in the past, patients would get sort of six, eight, ten litres of fluid, um, whereas we've now um, determined that early vasoactive therapy is actually better. Um, some patients will essentially be put on vasoactive therapy as soon as they hit the emergency department because they're so profoundly shocked, um, but that will be in conjunction with fluid resuscitation. Um, otherwise, most patients will normally get the sort of anywhere between two and four litres of fluids um, before getting vasoactive therapy. Now, crystalloid fluid is absolutely fine in the resuscitation, so saline, Hartmann's, either or, doesn't really matter when you're talking about the acute resuscitation. Um, and then we look at other fluids once patients are admitted to hospital. Source control, which we've talked about. Um, so anything that can be operatively managed um, needs to be. Um, you know, pockets of pus, um, cannot be treated by antibiotics. They need to be removed um, with source control. Um, and then vasoactive medication, um, which I've sort of touched on before with the fluid resuscitation. Um, and, you know, that uh, get, can get escalated. Like I said before, some people will be on two, three, four vasoactive medications, um, depending on the patient and their needs as well. Okay, so questions. Obviously a little bit difficult for you guys to ask questions, but I am open um, to being contacted if anybody does have any questions, um, and hopefully I can answer for you, them for you that way. Um, I hope that was informative. Um, thanks very much.